36 verse 1. What does it say, boys and girls? It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. So boys and girls, as we continue to learn about loving God, it's the theme for this month of January. Welcome to this second service, second Sunday of the month of January, today being 10th of January. We continue with the more stories from the Bible uh, that will help us remind us about loving God. So last Sunday, we talked about uh, Esther and you are learning how to seek God. So today, uh, Sharuben has a very interesting lesson for us. He's going to teach us about someone in the Bible who loved God. And when you love God, you obey him. So let's go to class, join teacher Ruben, get your pencil, your Bible, your notebook, so that you can listen to this person who obeyed God. Come with me to class. Um, good morning, kids. It's good to be with you again. Uh, today we are going to be... Um, Looking at the story of someone we all know and love, uh, we've sung about him many times, Father Abraham. So today we'll see what what gets a man to actually agree, you know, to to God's plan, to act to to God's plan slash test, and what makes a man leave everything, his entire family, to go to a land of X that God has shown him that he really doesn't know anything about. So we'll just begin with a brief word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessing towards us, and we thank you for being able to come here and to spend some time reading your word. And as we come to you today, we pray that uh, you, we pray that you're with us. We pray that you are attentive during the message, and that you may speak to us. And that as I teach, that everything I say and do will be acceptable to you. For in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay. So our story, as always, because we're talking about the Bible, begins in Genesis. That, you know, God creates a world, fills it with people who he wants to be his images. Everything goes well for a little bit of time until those people, Adam and Eve, uh, spoil the plan. So they eat the fruit and then they're cast out of the garden and God has to, you know, rebuild. So the whole Bible is about God's plan to bring humanity back to himself, to a place where they were still, he was in relationship with humanity in, in the garden. So our story then brings us to our first rebellion in Genesis, where Adam and Eve say, no, we don't want to do things your way, God. We'd rather do things our way. So they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and the relationship is severed between God and humanity. So then humanity, well, something else happens in Genesis 6. There's another rebellion, this time not by humanity, but by um, God's other sons, his divine beings. So that rebellion leads to the flood, and then God says, okay, we'll start again. He has another man named Noah with his um, three sons and their wives, and the plan is after the flood, they rebuild humanity. And God still has a plan. But that plan, again, is spoiled at the Tower of Babel, where humans decide, look, uh, we don't want to spread out. We just want to stay in this one place, and then we're going to build a nice tower and a temple. And the tower was not like this. The tower was like this, because you'll see it was called a ziggurat. But at Babel, God comes down and says, I'm going to scatter you all so that you'll finally do what I want which is for you to spread out and fill the earth instead of staying in one place and making your own religious system and your own little empire that is um, rebellious to me. So when God sends humanity out, he still has a plan, and that plan is to bring them back to himself, just as Adam and Eve and the rest of his creation used to commune with him in the Garden of Eden. And this plan involves a man called Abraham. So it goes right to Ur, gets his father, Terah, to move out of um, Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But Terah, well, halfway, when he's halfway there, he finds a nice place called Haran and he decides to settle. So shortly after Terah's death, God appears to Abraham, his son, and says, um, Follow me to a land that I will show you. Abraham doesn't know where he's going, 
but God also gives him a promise. I will make you a great, I will make you a great nation and the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And anybody who blesses you, I will bless. And anybody who dishonors you or takes you lightly, I will curse, slash, I will utterly destroy. So Abraham listens to the call of God and follows God out of Haran, which is a place where he knows, because he leaves his relatives there. And him and Sarai and Lot journey towards Canaan. Now, Abraham has a problem in life is that God has blessed him and he has become a great nation but he's thinking about what is going to happen later on in life. Because soon after his death, who is going to take over from him? So he tells God once again, and God answers him by reiterating the promise that I will give you a son of your own, and your servant is not going to inherit your estate. So Abraham doubts, Sarah doubts, but since God always keeps his promises, Abraham, gets him, Abraham and Sarah have a son, and his name is Isaac. So sometime in Isaac's life, some, sometime during Abraham's life when everything is going well, God has fulfilled his promise to Abraham. He has given him a son. He has made him wealthy. Abraham has success in everything he does and has become to himself. Abraham and his household have become the kind of giant entity or giant household that is enough to rival and go to war with kings to rescue Lot. So when things seem to be going well for Abraham, and Abraham and Sarah seem happy, is when God comes around and says, I am going to test him. And so our story gets us to Genesis chapter 22, where it says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So Abraham complies. He wakes up early in the morning, saddles his donkey, takes his two young men with him, and then also he takes his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place where God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifts his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then he tells his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there to the mountain, and worship him, and then we'll come back to you. And Abraham takes the wood of the burnt offering, lays it on Isaac, his son, and then he took his, in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, we have the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So both of them, they go together. So when they come to the place of which God had told him, Abraham builds the altar there and lays the wood uh, for the sacrifice and binds Isaac. Okay, good. So two things we pay attention to in the story, that Isaac notices, oh no, we, don't, we have the wood and the fire, we really don't have the sacrifice. And number two, Isaac willingly agrees to be bound by his father. But then, just as Abraham is about to land the killing blow with his knife, the angel of the Lord comes in and steps in and says, look, I now know that you fear me and you believe me, right? Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything for him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Now Abraham obeys and Aram is provided. And then the angel of the Lord calls down from heaven a second time and says, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose, and they went back home. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. 
So let's pay attention to this story where God tells Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. So we'll notice that Isaac has actually, Isaac notices that there's no ram. But when Abraham gets to the mountain, well, he finds a ram just at the moment when he's about to sacrifice Isaac. Now God, God knows that Abraham really believes and trusts what he's saying from what Abraham is doing. But we have the benefit of reading through the Bible to know that a thousand things are also happening in this story that might not relate to Abraham and Isaac. Because we know that this very mountain, on the mountain of which the, the Lord will provide, is the same, same mountain, the same, same mountain on which Jesus was crucified 2,000, 2000 or 3,000 years later, according to plan. So Abraham doesn't know that even as he's acting in faith, as he's obeying God, he's doing his part to foreshadow a prophecy that God himself will provide a sacrifice that instead of, so in, in the beginning, instead of, a, instead of Isaac, it was a ram. But now instead of us, it's Jesus Christ, you know, the intended sacrifice much, much later on. Okay. So, in summary, God tells Abraham, first follow me and I'll make you a great nation. Abraham agrees. Abraham is sad because he doesn't have a son, but he's become great. He wants somebody to inherit everything that he owns. And God says, your son will do it. But now just as things are going very well for Abraham and he's happy, him and Sarai have a son and everything is in the past, then God comes and says, look, let's just see how much you trust and believe in me. And then he tests him by asking him to sacrifice Isaac, right? And we'll know it was difficult for Abraham. Why? Because, number one, Abraham loves Isaac. For 20, 30 odd years of his life, since he was 99, 13 years of his life, since he was 99 years old and circumcised, he's waiting for a son. And it doesn't seem possible. And he thinks, oh, Sir, him and Sarah have a harebrained plan. They say, we'll make a son for ourselves. We'll call him Ishmael, because we'll make a son with Hagar. But God says, no, not this one. I'll bring you another son. But God is gracious, even in Abraham's mistakes. He says, I'll fix your mistake. We'll take care of Ishmael and Hagar, but I want to give you a son. And then when God eventually has a son, when God eventually blesses Abraham and Isaac with a, Abraham and Sarai with a son in their old age, they name him Laughter, Isaac. And you must imagine the joy in this household. So that's why it's very, very difficult for Abraham to take that step with Isaac to go to sacrifice, to go to make him the sacrifice on the mountain. And it, there's every indication that Isaac knows because Isaac notices there is no ram for the sacrifice. But Abraham will see he still has a belief that whatever happens, God will still keep his promise that he will make Isaac a great nation. Whatever means. Abraham just has come to the point in his life where he knows, I believe God. And even though it takes me to this crazy place where I have to trust what he says, I really trust, I will trust in what he says, and I will just go, I'll go along with it. So you see, so Abraham has come to know who God is and who God's character is. He's like, God will never let a promise of his slip. So whatever it seems like, you'll go up, you'll go down, but God will always keep his word. Okay, good. And also sometimes it's also you'll find that it's difficult to obey because heavens, it is crazy. So you'll notice Abraham doesn't tell the rest of his household. It doesn't appear that he tells the rest of his household. He just goes, Abraham, Isaac, two servants. Where are we going? We're going to worship to a mountain in the distance. You see, had Abraham told Sarai, had Abraham told the rest of his household, God's told me to sacrifice my son, they would have been like, are you crazy? You know? But since Abraham, by this time, has a good relationship with God and he knows God and his character, Abraham could have been going up the mountain expecting something's going to happen over here. And indeed it did, right? Aye. But you see now, Abraham's gone through this cycle where he's made a difficult decision to sacrifice, to say yes to sacrificing something and someone that he holds very very dear in his heart and that's not it was it must not have been easy for abraham to make that decision but because abraham trusted god and he knew that somehow god would make a way or something would happen he still goes along with it right 
And so, the second, you get to a point where it will be difficult, but should you choose to obey or to trust that what God says is true and what he promises will come to pass, number one, your faith in God will be strengthened, and number two, you will enjoy his blessings. Because immediately after, God now knows and is certain that Abraham will obey him, then he says, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, right? And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Which single offspring is he talking about who comes to possess the gate of his enemies? Jesus, in the end. So, in summary, from the story of Abraham, we learn that, number one, it's difficult to do so, but take the step, obey God, trust in who he is and his character, and he will always come through. And as a result of obeying him, you will always be blessed. It might not look like it at the moment, just wait, because he will always come through. Thank you. So, today's memory verse is from Romans 8.28 and Natalia will be presenting. My name is Natalia. I'm 10 years old and I have a memory verse and a song. Romans 8.28, it says, And for we know that in all things God, work, God works together for those for the good of those who love him, who have been called, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. The world is searching for an answer, a ray of hope in a hopeless world. Who can we turn to? Where is our rescue? There is someone, he's the answer, he's the light and he'll light the way. His name is Jesus, and he came to save us. He's the light, 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 light of the world, and he shines, shine, shines all over the earth, shining bright, bright, bright. He is the light of the world. He is the light, 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 light of the world. And he shine, shine, shines all over the earth, shining bright, bright, bright. He is the light of the world. The world is searching for an answer, a ray of hope in a hopeless world. Who can we turn to? Where is our rescue? There is someone, he's the answer. He's the light and he'll light the way. His name is Jesus and he came to save us. He is the light, light, light. Light of the world, and he shines, shine, shines all over the earth, shining bright, bright, bright. He is the light of the world. He is the light, 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 light of the world, and he shines, shine, shines all over the earth, shining bright, bright, bright. He is the light of the world. Thank you, Natalia, for that. That was a good presentation. We appreciate you.